Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 205. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, joined by someone who is dialing in at a very late time for them because they're on the other side of the world from me, Mr. Tom Energia. Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for having me. No worries, my friend. And thank you for making the time. I know that it's after midnight your time, and I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm glad that we could finally make this work. Like I said beforehand, we've been talking about having you on here for quite a while, but my work life has kind of gone nuts, and it's made it a little bit hard to be as flexible with my scheduling as I used to. But uh, thank you so much for bearing with me there, and I'm happy to have this conversation. Perfect. Likewise, man. Likewise. And I'm kind of a night owl, so it's good. <laughs> awesome. Me too. You just cannot yell out excitement. Everyone's asleep here, but uh, yeah, perfect, man. <laughs> well, with that said, why don't you give yourself a quick intro? Just tell everyone who you are, how they can find you, what kind of work you do and what you're known for. Oh man, I want to do that, but I don't want to sound boring and go all into jujitsu and all the stuff. So let's just do something else a little bit. Besides jujitsu, because everyone's obviously listening because of jujitsu interest, I'm a elementary teacher. Well, I used to be an elementary teacher, studied for that, and a outdoor sports instructor. So that's like survival and fitness and all the stuff in the outdoors, archery, you name it. And now I'm a full-time jiu-jitsu instructor and entrepreneur, and I run a jiu-jitsu clothing business. So with rash guards, geese, et cetera, and gear, and combining that with the, the classes and teaching. And I think those are the, are the most important things. And yeah, and obviously you said, uh, where can people find and see that's everywhere. It's just the same to manage up from BJ fanatics to Instagram to anything, but TikTok yet, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, uh, all other channels. Yeah, that's it, man. To manage or energy of March logs. Fantastic. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes like I always do. We'll get into the plugs again at the end, but maybe we can talk about the conversation topic here first and foremost. The thing about you that I find especially interesting is the education background. And that's, I think, how maybe we can find some interesting talking points here to discuss. A friend of the show, Ken Postnikoff, actually recommended I get you on a long time ago. And his topic idea was to talk about psychological safety, which is kind of a, a fancy word for basically saying, how do you create a culture where people are okay and comfortable with showing vulnerability, asking questions, you know, showing weakness? How can people speak up without being afraid that they're going to get shouted down? That's often what psychological safety means. And I've heard that concept in the workplace as a manager best practice but I mean, this is the area that you live and breathe in. So I'd love to get your feelings on what this means to you. Who oh, man. Yeah, I truly know Ken. He's an awesome guy. So uh, if he's listening, thank you so much, Ken, for uh, <laughs> connecting me and uh, Steve. That's, uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I think that creating a safe environment, especially in Jiu-Jitsu and the teaching background, the thing with Jiu-Jitsu is that we kind of tend to forget in martial arts is that if someone's capable of doing a sports or being good in competition or getting a certain belt is that that automatically equals them being a, a certified teacher or that equals them like if you have a black belt in jiu-jitsu you are uh, good to go to teach people and we often overlook the concept of teaching and how we teach jiu-jitsu and i don't want to go into the topic of teaching because we already discussed that and you have some you had some amazing people over talking about those things so things i also apply like the reverse classroom i think you talk about that with both lachlan giles and bruce hoyer if i'm not mistaken in some recent episodes but also how to teach but it's so close related to the safe environment because if you have a safe environment people are so much easier and eager to to learn the things you said like uh, having people asking questions and feeling safe on the mat and how you go about that that first comes off from understanding that what is it that people come for to train in jiu-jitsu and what are mostly their fears when starting out of jiu-jitsu so this week, by pure coincidence, I stumbled upon a video about pre-training anxiety. Are you familiar with that? Not the video specifically, but I am very familiar with the concept. I mean, I think anyone who has trained jujitsu for any length of time has 
at least had one of those days where they get anxious before going to class. Exactly. Yeah. I know I'm no exception. And they spoke about class in general. So not competition, not uh, sparring specifically, but just normal jiu-jitsu class. And that kind of got me thinking again, especially related to uh, having this plan with you, that for us, it's so normal. I mean, you're deep into jiu-jitsu. I heard you say on several occasions that you're uh, recreational, but uh, in my opinion, you're very deep and very proficient, high level in jiu-jitsu. So for us, it's normal to think about jiu-jitsu and feel safe at that place. But there has also been times, and maybe there are still times when even people who are longer into jiu-jitsu still have these anxieties. But let's focus now a little bit on beginners, uh, white belts, blue belts, or people without belts starting jiu-jitsu. The anxiety they have before starting a class So the pre-class anxiety, but also the, let's say, pre-trial class anxiety. So what is it that people look for before they go into a jiu-jitsu gym for the first time? And they don't really care about what competitions you've won or which or who, what black belt you are. Most people who care about that are jiu-jitsu practitioners to begin with. So let's go a little bit back to the beginners in jiu-jitsu and people before they begin jiu-jitsu. What makes them feel like something is a safe environment, especially for that that very important trial class? As you know, people have a different view on jiu-jitsu once they're several years in, as opposed to when they just start out. And I think a few key things that we should still be looking at today is, okay, what makes a, a safe gym? Like physical safe gym, obviously, like physical safe place to train, good mats and hy- hygiene, etc. But also what we focus on today is the more mental safe aspect for people to first start off and later off learning. And to get a good picture of that, we need to be aware that there's still people, even if they've been training for years, even if they have higher belts. And I think I'm able to say that it might never stop, even if you have a purple, brown or black belt, that people still feel some form of anxiety or afraid to ask questions to the coach or approach someone with the fear of sounding stupid. And I don't think that's only related to jiu-jitsu. I think this also applies to your field of work. Am I right? I mean, you work with a lot of people. You, if I'm not mistaken, advise people and lead teams in a tech company. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're absolutely right. This concept of psychological safety is something that first landed on my radar when I I saw an article about how they apply this practice at Google. And I thought it would actually have tremendous applications to the kind of work that I do. The idea behind psychological safety, like you said, different from physical safety. Uh, I think everyone who is a a borderline decent coach knows in jujitsu that you've got to look out for physical safety with your students. I think most (laughs) people would find that non-controversial, but psychological safety is probably a new idea. And a lot of people, uh, you know, you know how the jujitsu community is, right? Like everyone's all about being a a modern day warrior and being a tough guy. Mm -hmm. And so when you say things like psychological safety, a lot of people immediately get their back up and they'll start quoting stoic philosophy at you and how there's no such thing as a safe blah, blah, blah. Like, look, we need to get past that term here and past whatever your preconceptions are of how tough a jujitsu athlete should be. Because the reality is in any team environment, You need to create an environment where people feel safe sharing their ideas, their opinions, and their questions. And if you're that guy who gets up in front of the class and goes on about how jujitsu weeds out the weak and only the strong survive, like that is a great example of failing to address psychological safety concerns. Because when you say things like that, all you're doing is you're telling your students to just shut up and not bring anything up because the instructor will perceive it as a weakness if you do. So I've personally find that kind of old school way of talking about toughness in the martial arts is not really productive for good learning, especially like you said, with new students who are probably understandably super anxious about showing up and getting choked and armbarred, right? Yep. I couldn't agree more, man. You, you, you hit the the exact spot there. And especially if people focus on, yeah, okay, let's weed out the, the weakness and jiu-jitsu huh? uh, makes you tougher. Okay. That's all, all nice and fun until you're left with two people on the mat. And that's not how you run a club, uh, whether you're a coach or someone who runs a, a business, but also if you're just, or just, if you're a jiu-jitsu athlete, you need people to train and spar with the more, the better. And if you only focus on the more competitive people or the five guys that are super competitive, yeah, that's going to be a lonely time you're going to enjoy at the gym and a short time because that gym will not survive. And I think jiu-jitsu is for everyone as is often said and quoted. And it's nice to quote that, but I think it's also important to actually do that in in practice and actually practice that as a coach or as a gym or as a team. And a few things that do benefit that and a few things that are cues to check if that is in place. Like, do you have your students asking questions? Are they asking a lot of questions, especially white belts? If not, then you might think, oh, well, I do an excellent job in explaining. No, that might not be the case. The case might just be that they're too afraid to ask questions. 
uh, or that if they have asked questions that in previous times those have been answered like rudely or like yeah don't bother about that or yeah that's stupid and which which doesn't grow people to ask questions in the future anymore or be eager to learn and a theory that might might conclude in that how people feel on the mat i think you might be familiar with that with the self determination theory a little bit yeah but why don't you go ahead and break it down here Okay, cool. So it's going to be hard for people listening because I actually learn and apply all this stuff in, in my native language, which is Dutch, but I'm trying to like convert it to English as, as, as good as possible. So please don't hate me for uh, pronouncing words wrongly. But it's a, a theory related to also the pyramid and hierarchy of Maslow, actually looking at, okay, what do people need to be motivated, right? which is actually what we're looking for in students or people in general, especially when you work in a team and Jiu-Jitsu is if you like it or not, a team sport, in my opinion. So if people want to get motivated and what are the things people need to feel safe and okay, in the theory of the self-determination theory, they break it down into three basic needs, I think is the perfect word, the needs people have. So one of them is autonomy. I hope I pronounced that right, autonomy. Yep, you got it. Uh, thank you. So that's referring to one has a choice and willingness to be one's own behavior. And the opposite experience is, is feeling compelled or controls in one's behavior. So people want to have the feeling that they can choose and be the person they want to be. That's not just going for jiu-jitsu, but in general. Second one is uh, competence, uh, the experience of mastery and being effective in one's activity. Now, what is jiu-jitsu more than getting more competent and competent in a certain set of skills, in this case being sport or martial arts or whatever you want to brand it, but still uh, getting competent in jiu-jitsu, which we have certain degrees in, like belts, but also degrees in winning, like getting a tap, or winning competition. So those are some ways to measure that competence for the student himself or also by a peer, like a teacher or a competition or medals or anything that stimulates or rewards those competence. And finally, there's relatedness, like uh, the, the need to feel connected and a sense of belonging with other people or others in general, which is also a big part of jiu-jitsu, the community. Let's just refer to it as that or your teammates, etc. So those three key principles, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, those are the, the three things that mainly motivate people to have a good intrinsic motivation. And that intrinsic motivation could be driven by a few things, eh? some things that are very basic to know if you look at it. children or people in general could be rewarding. Let's take, for example, getting better, or let's take, for example, something more general, like people trying to lose weight. A reward could be, okay, you need to get to this goal because your employer will pay you more or because you will get this promotion or because X or Y. Another motivational trigger could be like punishment. So people do it because otherwise there will be a severe cost or anything negative happening to them or internal pressure, etc. But the better ways to motivate someone, like I think the intrinsic motivation would be a value. So people really value, uh, have a positive role model, etc., or something that, that values them in the motivation and a interest and enjoyment, which is usually what people stick to jitsu for. They really enjoy it. They have an interest and it gives them value and it's a positive uh, stimulus, I think is the word, to get them motivated. But we have to look at those three components being all equally present for people to be motivated. So if there's a lot of competence, so if, for example, someone is very competent in jiu-jitsu, but they don't feel related or they don't feel autonomous, that's missing two key components. Uh, the same goes vice versa. If you have a good feeling of being related in a club, but you feel zero competence or autonomy, that also is a, a controversial situation. So looking at those three things, that's where the theory is based upon. By the way, maybe I should mention for people who think it's interesting, I think it's uh, Daisy and Ryan, and to be precise, Edward Daisy, and I can't remember the first name of Mr. Ryan, but those, uh, those are the guys behind the theory in general. And I think it's a very interesting thing to look over and then try to look at that. Okay, how would we combine that in practical jiu-jitsu? Hmm? Competence is also very easy to, uh, to look at at jiu-jitsu. Autonomy. Uh, having people feel like they are a person in a team, because in jiu-jitsu you have like a team, you have a mat full of students. But as a coach, looking out, okay, how can I create a safe environment for people within, for example, that simple aspect of those three competence? It's okay, do you know the students' names? Do you know what interests them? Do you know their specific game? Do they feel seen by you as a coach or seen by you as a gym? Or do they just feel like one in, in a number or one in a dozen? Which sometimes is hard if you have a big gym, but I think those are one of the key components to making people feel as if they are appreciated, valued, seen within the community of jiu-jitsu or within the community of your gym. 
And that goes the other way around. Do the people feel that you as a coach or as a teacher are approachable? Are you still following me, by the way? I'm following you. Absolutely. Yeah. So how approachable are you as a coach? A thing that happens sometimes in jiu-jitsu with sometimes some old school cult-like behavior is, yeah, you cannot uh, ask a coach to roll. You cannot ask a coach questions all the time. You cannot bother the coach. I'm like, wait, why are we doing that in general? Is it because coaches back in the day or still are just annoyed by white belts or what they think are stupid questions? And what is that doing for your gym culture? And what is it doing for the mental safe space that you try to create or maybe want to create for your students or for your gym besides the physical safe place obviously same thing goes like asking questions and the looking out for students not only by a physical aspect also but like okay mentally how do you protect students from other students and it makes that sounds a bit weird but sometimes you've been there as a coach right that you know a certain student might better be off not rolling with a certain student who might be a bit too heavy spazzy aggressive competitive you have to you sometimes have to cater to those people and like steer them in the right direction. Do you see people, do you see all the people at your gym as individuals or do you just look at it as a group like okay, this is a group I'm teaching? And also a thing that it's a I think is a rabbit hole some teachers might get trapped in is focusing too much on certain students, which could either be the ones that are very competitive. So a teacher focuses a lot on the competitive students or the higher belts. Or it could be the opposite. They focus a lot on the trial classes, which they want to motivate and get to sign up or the beginners, which have a lot to learn and actually ask a lot of questions. I'm not sure which one is, is more. It depends obviously from gym to gym, but I think there's a lot of gyms where coaches with the best intentions, I think, fail to look at all the students because they focus a lot on the more students that are so competitive, the students that are so involved, the students that are always there. And that has the possibility of letting other students feel as if they're not part of the team. And one of the things is if people feel left out within any structure, whether that be your business or a business or a class or anywhere in the world, that might be for a lot of people a trigger to to leave or quit. And that drives back to the theory to make it a little bit full circle of being that drives back to that relatedness, that third component of those three, those three things that makes people motivated and if you don't feel autonomous or related and you just feel like one of the students within a huge group of jiu-jitsu or martial arts yeah that might be one of those triggers that doesn't make you feel morally socially safe and yeah that's where your jiu-jitsu journey ends because i think that the fact that 90 percent of the people quit at white belt then please correct me if i'm wrong with that number but it's just a number that's stuck with me sometimes or at least a lot of white belts quit in jiu-jitsu that's a known fact and people saying, yeah, jiu-jitsu is not for everyone because it's so tough. I think that's too black and white. I think there's a there should be a beautiful place there to look at, okay, how can we prevent all those white belts and all those beginners from quitting? And does it have to do with jiu-jitsu being hard physically? Or does it have to do also maybe, possibly, with jiu-jitsu being hard uh, socially and mentally? And how can we, as coaches, fix that and be responsible for that? I love this breakdown here of these three pieces of self-determination that are, are so key because I think you've touched rightly on the fact that most jujitsu instructors don't look at things through a complete lens here. You know, competence, yes, absolutely. At the end of the day, people train jujitsu because they want to get better at jujitsu. That seems to be something that was that should be obvious. Although I would argue that a lot of the time a mistake that coaches make is they have trouble understanding that people define competence differently because they have different goals, right? If, for example, you as the instructor are a retiring competitor, you know, and your your entire life has been structured around winning gold medals, maybe that's the milestone, the bar that you define for what is competence, right? How many tournaments do you win? If that's how you define competence, you're going to find yourself at odds with a lot of your students, because like you brought up, the vast majority of people who train jujitsu are weekend warriors and regular people. That's the whole marketing behind jujitsu. The whole reason jujitsu became so popular was because it was marketed as a solution for the weaker, smaller, less athletic person to defend themselves. So you got to understand that 90% of the people who walk in through your door are going to be those people. You're not going to have like high level elite competitors walk into your door and want to, you know, meddle with your name on their gi, that's not going to be very frequent. It's going to be far more likely that it's just regular people who don't necessarily know what they're getting into. So I think when we define competence, a mistake that instructors often make is they expect their students to be standing at the top of the podium. 
every single time. And I think that that expectation can often be at odds with what the majority of the students in the class want. And that's something I've, I've always found odd about jujitsu, which is that there is this kind of minority of people who have chosen to make jujitsu their entire life. And they kind of impose their goals on just the people who actually pay the bills, right? The regular people who show up, they want to train twice a week. They, you know, their goals are, Hey, I want to get in shape. I want to learn how to defend myself. I want to not get my arms torn off. Right. That's, that is usually what the, the standard grappler is looking like. So if you're evaluating these people through the lens of, well, are they winning medals? All you're going to do is make your students feel inferior because, that's not the goal that they came in here with, right? And a lot of instructors, especially the the better ones, have woken up to this and they structure their classes and they manage goals accordingly. And they understand that, hey, like, look, it is great that there's a small percentage of people who want to really push themselves and succeed at the highest levels in jujitsu. But that is very much an edge case, right? You can accommodate those people and you can still accommodate the vast majority of hobbyists who want to come into your gym and just have fun and ultimately help you pay the bills, right? You can do both. And I love how you've kind of called out that making your students have a clear and achievable path to competence is one of the best ways to create a good environment where they're going to want to stay around. Yeah, because let me ask you the question, how many people... You know, there's a lot of guys who are very into jiu-jitsu competition, right? And that's beautiful. It's, it's an amazing scene and it's good for the sport. And I truly, for my own students, I always encourage them to at least try it once and the ones that are very into it. I'm always there for them and we have a lot of focus on competition in that case. But let me ask you a question. Whoever signed up to a jiu-jitsu school for the first class and said, I want to be a world competitor? Yeah, probably very, very minimal. Yeah, yeah. Th- maybe there are people. Most of those people probably don't even know what the IBJJF is by exactly. the time they sign up. Exactly. So trying to hold that goal on top of them is really unfair. Yeah, exactly. So when we look at people try out jiu-jitsu for the first time, a lot of people are either into self-defense, they saw UFC or anything, or Joe Rogan, they thought it was cool, the trouble solving, the flow, a lot of things that could be the motivation to start. I think there's a distinction between those two things. I also started jiu for a different reason than why I stuck with jiu-jitsu. And I think that goes for a lot of people. Some people think they just want to get in shape and then they found a love of their life. And some people just want a form of self-defense and they find a good community. So what gets you to start and what gets you to stay isn't always the same thing. But I hardly have anyone coming in saying, yeah, I want to be a world-renowned athlete and go to ADCC. Because no one knows what it is when they start out jiu-jitsu, unless they know about jiu-jitsu, which is hard because they didn't train. So I think that's 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 very fun. In MMA, for instance, that might be a little bit different. With MMA trial class, we have a lot of people who said, yeah, I want to do competitions because they watch the UFC. So their first trigger and their first motivation is usually seeing that UFC and want to be like those guys. And then eventually they usually stay because they really like the sport when they realize it's very hard to compete in that. But in jiu-jitsu, it's very, very weird because we focus so much on competition and results. Uh, that's the, the competence, one of those three pillars of the self-determination theory. Whilst for us as coaches, that's important or might be important. But for 90% of the students, that they don't care that much. And they are recreational people. They are maybe dads, or moms or students working, training, whatever. And they just really enjoy jiu-jitsu. They enjoy the community, which I think is very awesome in jiu-jitsu. The jiu-jitsu community is a beautiful thing. And they really enjoy the challenges that jiu-jitsu give. And they train for the, for a fun health part and all these different kinds of motivations where competition in and starts, maybe later on, isn't always one of them. I think there's so much focus on that, as, as you just said. So I, I just agree with what you said, which might not always be so grounded. And people saying, yeah, you either get strong or you quit, etc. Okay, I think there's something to say for... I think, what's the word? Persistence or pushing through a little bit? Persistence. Persistence, yeah. I think that's that's something very important in Jiu-Jitsu. When you feel stuck for the first time in bottom side control or mount, you think like, oh, wow, this is heavy. I want to quit. And then finding that strength within yourself mentally to push through that, I think that's one of the most beautiful things about our sport, which also translates to those people's general lives besides the mat. But I think we shouldn't use that to weed out everyone else and use as some form of shield to hide behind. Yeah, jiu-jitsu is just very tough. And I think the numbers speak for itself that a lot of people quit jiu-jitsu. And we think people quit a lot of blue belt, but statistically that's not the case. The thing is only when a blue belt quits, it's more noticed because it's a blue belt and you might be more familiar with them. But most people quit at white belt. Wouldn't you agree? I don't have the data, but I absolutely think you're right. I mean, there's a lot of people who come into jiu-jitsu 
they try it for a week or so, and then they just decide, yeah, it's just not for me, and they move on. And, you know, to some extent, that is just people being people, right? Not everyone's going to love the same thing, but I would suspect that, as you're kind of implying, there's probably a lot of people who would have been more inclined to stick through it and get over that initial learner's hump. They'd probably be more inclined to do that if they had a better onboarding experience and they didn't feel like they were being judged. They didn't feel like they were being thrown into a shark tank, right? The, the way that you onboard people matters tremendously. Let me give you a practical example, just to, just for fun and giggles, because data is, is, is one thing and speculating is another thing. I'll just give you a practical thing. As a coach, a full-time coach, this happened to me last Saturday. So that's yesterday, sorry, yesterday and last week. I had a student recently, uh, not naming any names, he's 15 years old, and he got onboard at an open mat pretty roughly by a more experienced adult training partner. And I believe this partner had the best intentions, but you know, sometimes Jiu-Jitsu is what it is. And he quit training for a few weeks. I wasn't at the open mat, so I didn't know, but I didn't see him at the classes. So I sent a message, hey man, how's life? Uh, what's happened? He said, yeah, I got injured a little bit. And he mentioned that he was mentally not happy to train anymore. So obviously, as a coach, I think, as everyone should be, that's not fun to hear. And if you say, yeah, then he shouldn't uh, cry and get tough. I don't agree with that. So I, I felt very sorry for the kid. Once again, he's 15 years old, and he just started jiu-jitsu. Uh, zero strike by though. So I thought, hey, that's that's a, a sad experience here. He had to do with that. So I sent some text messages, called him, and uh, I talked to him. Okay, so he decided to come back to training. Now, next class, instead of throwing him for the sharks, I asked a few students, which was kind of a practical experiment, a few of the more advanced students to, hey, sorry, advanced white belts, I should mention, hey, roll with this kid and don't tell him, but just let him have a good good training. Don't have to let him win or get a tab necessarily, but just go easy on him without letting him know that you go easy on him. And a few of them did, which was beneficial, not only for the 15-year-old student to get his confidence back, and feel appreciated, have a good time, and uh, etc. But also for the more, a little bit more advanced students to put their ego in check, have someone submit them and win from them, and never tell them that they let them do it. So, which also is, I think, good ego check. Now, what happened? And once again, this was actually yesterday. He sent me a message after the class. An amazing class. I was so happy to be back in Matt. Thank you so much for calling and chatting, which was the first thing he really appreciated. But also, I want you to know, I submitted someone for the first time today. I feel really cool, and uh, thank you so much. And that is one of those practical examples, and there's tons of others, where the kid could have stopped jiu-jitsu last week and had all the reasons to quit after the experience he had. And you can have the discussion about him not being tough enough or whatever, but I think that's not the case. I think the case is he had all the reasons to quit jiu-jitsu back when that happened, that he got injured and felt mentally not at the right place. And then giving him his confidence back and his uh, relatedness and autonomy, which was me seeing him and realizing, hey, there's a reason this kid isn't coming to class. What's up? What's happening? What can I do for you? And then giving him that confidence back is what actually makes him get back to jiu-jitsu now. And, and I'm not sure about the long-term effects yet for this specific case, but I've had this happen so many times in my past over a decade of teaching that I truly believe that uh, this is a way to get a lot of people that might almost have quit jiu-jitsu or are on the verge of quitting jiu-jitsu just that little, how do you say, notch in the back, or well, you get what I mean, that just a little bit of support to get them yeah, back on the mats and keeping them on the mats happy and uh, satisfied as a, as a team member. You know, I'm glad that you brought this up, and you're the only person other than me, I think, that has advocated for throwing a role. And I do suggest doing this sometimes for a very similar reason. I've, I've said on the podcast, because it is very common, as you know, in jujitsu for the ego to get into the driver's seat and for students to do stupid things when they're rolling because they're trying to win rather than trying to learn and stay safe. And everyone has that problem. I mean, even as a black belt, I catch myself sometimes thinking like, man, I am, I am way too invested in who wins this casual role. And I've said <laughs> that sometimes the best thing to do, like if you walk into the mats and you can feel that you're in one of those moods, throw your first role, like just go in, find someone who normally you would beat and, you know, put up a realistic fight. But ultimately your goal is to lose quite publicly because that's going to kill your ego right out of the gate. But it also has the benefit of giving that other person a confidence boost. Now, there are going to be a ton of people who listen to this advice and they immediately get their hackles up because they're going to say things like, we're not trying to create a bunch of babies who win participation trophies. We're trying to create modern day lions who are going to go off into, you know, all of that bullshit that people always say. Mm -hmm. And to that, what I say is like, look, what is your goal in the gym? Is your goal to win 
or is your goal to develop skills yeah. and get better? Yeah. Because yeah. if you have any remote interest in modern teaching practices, your goal should be to get people to go in there and focus on skill development. Winning around achieves nothing, right? In the gym, it doesn't achieve anything yeah. at all. It's nothing but a temporary ego boost at someone else's ego expense. And one way to resolve that is to focus less on who's going to win and more on, as so many people have said on this podcast, putting yourself into intentionally difficult positions so that even if you're better than the other person, they've got a chance. And then you can level the playing field a bit. You can still get good training out of a less experienced person. And moreover, you make them feel better and more valuable rather than just beating them up and putting them down, right? And that's how you invest in the future of building your team. If you drive everyone off, they're not going to stick around long enough to actually become good. They're going to leave before their trial's up. Yeah. And then weeding out people who you think are not good enough, well, maybe they, they would have been better if you had guided them a little bit better and helped them a little bit better. They could have been your best teammates one day. You never know because you thought they were weak in the beginning. And also when you look at the people who say that the most, well, look back at how you started. And I say this in the gym as well to my students. I say you cannot win from your team members. I repeat that once again. You cannot win from your team members. And obviously there's something to go for competition training and getting people a bit more, more tough. And, and it's always a gray area, but I think having people going through uh, hard rounds sometimes is good, but also having people, like you just said, uh, throwing around, I think was the term you used, is something very important. And sometimes we do this with warm-up, we go like flow roll, and then I say, okay, so one goes on offense and the other one goes on submission defense. So submission defense doesn't mean you don't get caught in a submission or you don't tap, submission defense means, or depending on your partner from getting submission, it means getting in as many submissions as you can this round and then trying to escape. But that gives your partner a lot of weapons. He can only go for submissions on you and you can only go for defense, but your defense isn't turtling up and not giving away anything. That's not defense. That's very early game. But submission defense, giving away stuff, giving your back, giving the choke, and then trying to go as far as you dare before you start your defense. And those are some really interesting rounds sometimes to observe. And that's where white belts get to go very far and catch the back on blue belts or higher belts, which they normally wouldn't get in a full on round, I think. We know for practice, but where they do get this confidence of, hey, I can, I can now pass, I can get the back, I can get the choke in. And then sometimes the higher belt escapes because that's as far as they go before they start implying their defense. And sometimes they don't because they let it go a little bit too far. And even too far white belt on your back and a fully locked in rear neck choke or bow and arrow choke, yeah, that's kind of hard to escape sometimes. But those are very interesting rounds. And I say, you cannot win this round. You cannot win by not tapping. It doesn't exist. You can only win by trying to go as far as you dare or trying to experiment as much as possible. And sometimes we have some, some games. So I walk up to students and I give them a mission for the role. So for instance, I go to you, Steve, I say, okay, so this role, your goal is to only submit your partner using your lapel or whatever, or your goal is to only play bottom positions. And you do not tell that goal to your training partner and he doesn't know it. And, and then you just do the role and the other partner sometimes also get a mission and then they have to guess what the other's goal was. I hope you're still following me. That's a really cool idea. It's a beautiful way for people to roll. Sometimes I even have people roll in force and then they, so one of the guys, especially when the gym is crowded, sometimes we have, we have a lot of people on the mat and there's not enough space. And then we work in different, we don't just do rounds two because people are kicking each other in the face because it's too crowded. So then people give each other goals and groups of four. And then one blue belt or white belt gives a, a goal to another student rolling. He whispers in the ear, okay, you can only do arm submissions. So arm bars, Americanas, Kimuras, uh, all that stuff, but no chokes. Or to the other student, you can only do chokes or you cannot do any submissions at all. You can only score points for dominant positions like mount, back mount, etc. And then the, the guys who gave the goal are observing and trying to see what the goal of the other person was and trying to measure points, etc. So they get to understand the game better. Also linking to that competition, understanding the point system, etc. And those create some very interesting rounds where people are so less focused on winning. Not because you say don't focus on winning, but because you give them something else. You actually draw their attention from away from winning in a, a game form. And the fun thing is a lot of people aren't even aware that they aren't focusing on winning anymore. They're just so focused on winning but they're winning the game, the specific game they were given, which actually creates a much more fun environment sometimes that has the side effect of people leaving their ego without them actually realizing they're leaving the ego. And I think that's, that those are some very fun, practical ways to see how this can be implemented in a normal class of Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Longtime friend of mine, and he's actually a black belt under Rafael Lovato Jr. now. His name is Kabir Bath. He's, I believe, the 
head of international at Lovato's Jiu-Jitsu Association, but he uh, just shared with me a lecture he actually gave in front of the Lovato instructors. And uh, one of the things he said was, you make friendships when you play games with people. You don't make friendships when you fight them. And I think that's just such an important lesson when it comes to the kind of culture that we create in our gyms. I mean, I think that when we try to act like the best jujitsu gym is this high pressure performance environment where everyone's always trying to win. I think that's a lot of projection, honestly, from the instructor, right? I think there's a degree of survivorship bias where by virtue of the fact that the instructor made it all the way to black belt and became an instructor, they think they're great. They think they know what they're doing because it worked for them. So therefore it's going to work for everyone else, which obviously is a logical fallacy, right? Mm -hmm. But I think then that what instructors do is they use that to justify this highly competitive, aggressive environment where they will say things like, well, you know, we're, we do this because we want to weed out weakness. Like, look, that's just a shitty excuse, right? Basically, you've created a hostile environment. Your customers have left yep. you and you've used this macho justification rather than taking ownership <laughs> over what actually happened, right? What actually happened was you provided a poor business experience. No one wanted to hang around, so they left. It's not because they're weak little sheep or whatever and you're a lion. It's because yep. you've created an environment that is not conducive to good training. Similar to how instructors often brag about how long it takes them to give out black belts, right? You'll hear people say things like, well, so-and-so is a great instructor because he's very stingy with his black belts. It takes 20 years to get a black belt under them. And, and people talk about that like that's a good thing. And I, I've always found that weird too. You know, if if you went to a university and they bragged that their four-year bachelor program took most people 12 years to complete, you'd go to a different university, right? Because you're not really <laughs> yeah, getting yeah, what you're, yeah, pay, yeah. you're paying for. It's not efficient. But in jujitsu, there's a lot of excuse making, I think, for creating these hostile environments, whereas everything we know about coaching and development tells us we should be focusing on gameplay and making it fun. That is so important to retention over the long term and also for skill development. And that's the thing that I think is counterintuitive, right? Yep. Keeping it playful is not going to create a gym full of weak people. It's going to create a gym full of people who are super passionate and stick around and that's the precursor to getting better, right? You're not going to get good if you leave in the first month. It's the exact same thing that applies for kids. I did this with the class when I was an elementary teacher. Happy kids learn way more efficient than unhappy kids drilling for hours and hours. The same thing goes for adults. If you're happy at the place you work at, or if you're happy and you feel appreciated at the place you work at, or at your family, or at any place, you will be more motivated and you'll have a higher success rate. And about having a fun place to, to train what do you think is the what do you think humor and uh, in in classes and in teaching adds or what's the place for humor in jiu-jitsu anyways should we just focus on okay guys this is technique we're going to do a b c this pass okay uh let's go or do you think humor has a place in a jiu-jitsu school and should have in a martial arts school I think humor absolutely should have a place right humor is one of the things that makes us human and if you try to take that out of the cultural experience of your gym you're making it harder for people to forge connections. And like you said, relatedness is one of the most important things that people look for in terms mm -hmm. of how they evaluate themselves, right? Is how can I relate to people? What's my support structure look like? And everyone who's stuck around jujitsu for a while has probably gone through the same metamorphosis where very soon jujitsu becomes not just about learning to, to grapple, but it becomes part of your social experience, right? It becomes your personal social network and your third place, and it becomes very important to you. And if you're an instructor, you want to encourage that, right? Because not only does it make retention better when it comes to people remembering info because they had more fun, yep. it also makes retention better because people are likely to stick around. So I am a big fan of adding humor to the classroom. I'm a big fan of having a two-way conversation with the people in the room. You know, when instructors say things like, shut up and just follow my instructions, I always think that's something that they're, if they if they have the foresight, they're going to wind up regretting one day because you're just killing that possibility of building relationships with the people who are ultimately paying your bills. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that you, we think alike on all, all these topics, thankfully, and I think that's, that's very interesting. Uh, it's also nice to see it happening a lot now in the current Jiu-Jitsu meta, if I can call it that way. For instance, take, take Craig Jones. 
amazing guy, amazing jiu-jitsu athlete. I think no one can argue that. But also look at how he is on social media and how he exploits the humor part of jiu-jitsu. He is not one of the guys taking it super serious. Well, in, I'm safe to say he's one of the guys making a lot of jokes in jiu-jitsu. He is one big, amazing joke. And I think that's very good for the sports to not only focus on the very tough and serious part of jiu-jitsu and martial arts, but also to say, hey, this is a beautiful sport. And yes, there are aspects of it that are very tough. And yes, that is a beautiful thing about it. But let's not make, we're still adult people in a padded room trying to strangle each other for fun. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about? And him walking around a leopard print, uh, slamming kids in kids class, he looking kids and trying to fight Gabby Garcia. I think that's one of the, the coolest things there is. And, and all these memes making jiu-jitsu a bit more, fun and, and open and approachable for people and, and new students. So I now have one of my interns. He's going to do an interview with a beginning students. Like what got you into the G2 and what made you stay, especially for beginners? Because if you're 10 years in, it's it maybe so long ago to remember what got you into the G2. But for beginners, it's very interesting for me as a coach to know, okay, what is it? And if you Google some things about Jiu-Jitsu safety, there's a lot of blogs and there's a lot of topics covering and asking questions on fora and stuff, is BGJ safe? Or is martial arts safe? Or what is a safe martial arts? I'm, I'm just quoting this exactly from a website. So there's a lot of people there searching for that before they go to a martial arts class. And I don't find that hard to imagine. I think, yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. I think a lot of people are a bit anxious, maybe, maybe even scared to go to their first class or their to start up martial arts. And I think a lot of people, before they start, search what is a safe martial art. And I think a lot of people are therefore drawn to jiu-jitsu because you can go all in in jiu-jitsu without the risk of getting punched and elbowed in the face. And the fact that people are looking for this so much and the fact that it's a question so much asked by beginning students means that we have to do something with that information as coaches. And we need to at first realize it and then accept it and try to use that information and think about, okay, how can we make this a safe place? How can we, if someone comes for a trial class, so for instance, you walk onto the mat now, Steve, you feel at home, right? Because you're black belt, it's the mat, it's your place. But remember the very first time ever in your life you stepped on the mats. Did you feel at home immediately? Did you did you think like, oh yeah, it's a cool place? Or did you walk into the gym, you see all these amazing tough guys with cauliflower ears and colored belts, you're like, oh my God, where am I? And how do you make people feel safe there? And I think as a, as a coach, throwing people into the deep, I don't think that's bad. Now, this is, this is where it's controversial because all people are different. And now is the, the even kind of controversial and hypocritic part is when I started jiu-jitsu, I traveled a long way. I, I was very skinny and light. I was, I was like this cliche stereotype of jiu-jitsu. And this purple belt was completely mangling me. I remember it was like my second class or third class. And I was... I was getting frustrated so much. And I said to him, hey man, this is my third class. Like asking him to go easy, but I, I didn't ask him. I just said, hey man, it's my third class, you know? And he said, yeah, yeah, I know. And he went 200%. And for me, that was a good, yeah, 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 I know, I know. But for me, that was a good thing because for me, that made it click like, okay, there's not going to be any handouts here. Let's go to them. And then I, I, I flipped the switch. So for me, it was a good thing. So I'm not saying that that's the hard part about this. I'm not saying black and white that it's bad to, to be tough. I'm just saying, as I so far you have agreed with me, that we focus so much on the tough part that we also fail to neglect, wait a minute, there's also a lot to say about the social safe part of the sport. And for me, it was a good thing because it made me get into jiu-jitsu, but many others would have quit at that moment. And a lot of students did and do still nowadays. So looking at, okay, what gets people their first step on the mat and how can we make them feel safe? Instead of saying, yeah, here's a gear, just line up and try to follow this weird martial arts with 200 steps where we mix English, Portuguese, and Japanese in one sentence <laughs> and have fun. Oh, and now we're sparring. I think there's a lot of things we can do. I'm trying out some different things now. Now, mind you, with me trying things out doesn't mean that they are necessarily good or bad. I'm just trying it out for myself. So I'm just sharing my thoughts and experiences. What I do nowadays with white belts, I pair them up with someone who think matches them for body type and personality. And I say, hey, this is now... So for instance, uh, Steve, you come in. I say, hey, Steve, this is Bob. This is going to be your partner for today. He's going to help you out. You're going to do the first drills with him. And I tell Bob, while Steve gets in, hey, today you're going to help Bob, show him around in jiu-jitsu. But then he has like one, he has like this anchor point in his class full of all these unfamiliar people in this weird place filled with mats and violence where he has someone that's completely focused on him. Because as a coach, if you focus only on that trial class, you know that's not possible in, in practice. 
And if you do so, you're neglecting all your other students. But having them, I call that a body system. So having them have a body for that specific class, for the first class. And then they switch. Obviously, they switch partners sometimes with drilling. But their body is their their go-to point and their first sparring round, et cetera, et cetera. I think those are some of the simple tools I'm now trying to, to have people feel more safe besides humor which is think i think is very important i use music as well having some music during rolling which with different different styles of music for different opportunities having people feel at home making some jokes and also facilitating for a social uh, possibility now what i mean with the social possibility is during class during instruction and during drilling you can socialize but you know you're not going to talk about your weekend or about the adcc match you watch or anything so i, I see a lot of students sticking around after class you know, stretching a bit, rolling a bit, running some techniques, but also socializing or just in the locker room. I don't know if that's also the culture at the place uh, you train or teach at. Oh, yeah. Where I mean, where I train in most of the gyms that I, I visit at, pretty much once you hit Purple Belt and beyond, it just turns into a big social club. Like half, half the yeah. class is just sitting there talking to the other old guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially. And, and, and it's fun to see that if you facilitate at least the possibility that's important because one of the things as a coach that I, I, I truly have issues with, which just bother me personally, is when I teach a class and after my class, there's uh, straight away another class. So I have that at three places. So I teach jiu-jitsu and we have one minute to get out and then the judo class starts with another teacher or the kickboxing class starts with another teacher. And I've seen so far every time at the gyms where that happens and the gyms where after class, there's just an hour of free nothing people hang on the mats for longer they they just hang on the mats they stretch they roll they chat and as you say a lot of the the older guys they just you know start babbling about everything and nothing or before class or having a coffee at the at at the bar if, if that's available at the gym and at the gym where the the classes are immediately after my class people just go outside or go to the dressing room and they keep hanging there sometimes for 20 minutes, but sometimes even for hours where I have to say, guys, please get a life, go home, get a hobby. And then they say, no, this is our hobby. And I'm like, oh yeah, wait, that's good. But um, (laughs) facilitating that possibility and also being there as a coach for students after or before class or just those socializing moments in the dressing room. For instance, I get to class, I'm I'm always dressed. So I get my uh, nogi underneath my my, my tracksuit or anything or I'm dressed. But I just sit in the dressing room with the guys, with the students, just being there, just casually listening, participating in conversations, having a chat with them about the weekend, all those things. And that actually makes them better at jiu-jitsu. Now, that's fun to hear because, you know, how can that make anyone better at jiu-jitsu? But like, because that comes back to the point that I was making is people that feel appreciated, people that feel valued and seen and feel at home at a gym, they will grow not only as people, but also in their jiu-jitsu. How do I know this? Because, well, we've seen it on our competition as well. You know, we focus so much on the social aspect And a lot of my students do so well at competition. And that's not because we focus on competition that much. And I I think these two are so closely related that it's even ironically to see the more you be focused on being tough and on competition, the less results you might possibly get. And once again, there's the controversy of not being black and white. There's something to say for both. But I think the social aspect is not only important for recreational jiu-jitsu people feeling better and having a good place and blah de, blah de, blah but it also truly benefits their competence it does benefit the results and it does benefit not only atmosphere in your gym but also the more practical results people get in their jiu-jitsu because they feel so uh, socially safe and so so seen and so appreciated at least that's my my humble opinion yeah i love that philosophy and i love that you pointed out that this whole thing about being tough is it's not a yes or a no thing. It's a polarity. There's times when it's good. There's times when it's not, and there's a spectrum. It's not as simple as a light switch. We've talked on the podcast before about how the trick to growth is you have to go beyond your comfort zone, right? You want to take a step just beyond your comfort zone. And then once you get comfortable there, you want to do it again. So you have to do that at some point training jujitsu. If you're invested in growing, it is going to require a degree of toughness and you can develop that but there's a time and a place for that, right? We're ultimately all human beings. We all have weaknesses and frailties and insecurities and expecting people to be 100% tough all the time is not sustainable or realistic. 
So there is a time and a place. And I think that when someone is first getting onto the mats and they're learning jujitsu and they're still not quite comfortable with this, they might not even really fully understand what it is. That's not the time to try to weed out the weak, right? That's the time to show your culture and to give people a reason to stick around. And then maybe a few stripes into their white belt, they'll buy in. And at that point, that's when they'll push themselves beyond the limits of comfort, right? But that's always going to be more effective, I think, than the coach just trying to whip their students and basically being a drill sergeant. I just don't think that's a good way to learn. Yeah. And then also adding to that is, okay, so take a class of students, for example, like between 20 or 50 students and see that not every one of them has the same motivation and should be motivated in the same way. And that's hard because I know some people just need to, when they come to class, they, they had a long day at work or at college or whatever, you know, you can see that when someone comes in and they're just so relieved to finally be at jiu-jitsu. Those guys sometimes just want to hear, man, hey man, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm happy to see you, appreciate you being here and uh, let's have a fun night. And some people are more driven and they do really enjoy the toughness of jiu-jitsu and that's okay. So I think something I do want to point out is I have no problem with, I mean, I've been doing jiu-jitsu and martial art for a long time and I myself have been mangled, murdered, injured and, uh, and anything in between. And yes, I'm very tough on myself and I'm tough on certain students, but I'm not tough on everyone. And also I'm very supportive on certain students, but I'm not supportive on anyone. And I think one of the hardest things as a coach is, and I hope the word is the same as English, is differentiating. So yeah. uh, catering between the differences between your different students. So you don't have, I don't give a class for one group. I don't have a group. We have a group. Within the group, you have certain subgroups. And within the, within the group, you also have individuals. And every individual has a different way of getting coached. So sometimes I walk around and I see someone doing a technique wrongly and I could give them 10 details they should do better. And all I say is, nice, Bob, looking good. Or, hey, man, I love how you use your grips. Very nice. And give specific compliments because I know that's what the person needs to stay motivated and keep on training and improving. And some people, some of my students, I know they really appreciate and they really enjoy. I know that sounds weird, but let's be honest. It's the truth. They just enjoy me telling them, no, I, hey, man, you should do it like that. Like, Come on, man. Come on, I need you to give more and pushing them a little bit in a, in a healthy way. I want to add to that because that toughness, some people really enjoy that and some people really do grow with that more so than with just uh, social supportive and safety. And that's where I think is the fun part of our conversation is finding the balance in between those things, finding the balance not only for yourself and your gym, but also for all your individual students and the groups that you teach. The same thing goes for kids, for example. Some kids really need that positive encouragement and some kids are often better off with just getting a little bit of a tough love i think tough love is american pressure expression you guys use so i'm going to use it yeah. now perfectly tough love which there's nothing wrong with that as well and tough love also goes for adult students being a little bit tough on students sometimes really gets them up to the next level and pushes them as you so well pointed out yourself which i totally agree with is just out of that comfort zone and with just out of that, I mean, that that's the sweet spot you want to be in. You don't want to push them that far out of the comfort zone that they quit, but you just want to keep on pushing the barrier. And for some people, they all, they already push themselves a lot of out of the comfort zone. I think you get what I mean. Some students are so tough on themselves. They say, yeah, today sucked. I'm not getting any better. I hit this plateau. Man, I have students weekly, Steve, that, that feel like they want to quit jiu-jitsu because it feels like they suck and everything hurts or they are not improving. And then sometimes they just need me or someone else to tell them, hey, man, you're really growing. You just don't see it yourself or you compare yourself to your teammates, which isn't good for this or this reason, or you compare yourself to your teammates who are also growing every week. So you do not realize you're growing as well. So put it in perspective and wait until someone new comes in and you see how much you've grown and compare yourself to only one person and that is yourself. So some people really need that support. Other people are more benefit with that tough love. And I think finding that sweet balance in between and at least being aware of it, that's where there's a lot of room for improvement. Now, combining that with the statistics, we know that a lot of people quit at white belt and maybe finding a relation between those two things and improving jiu-jitsu for everyone is the result of this. It's funny you bring up this point about how coaches need to learn to kind of read the room and everyone's different and they're going to be motivated in different ways and often at different times too. Sometimes a person really needs that tough love, but then that same person a month later 
might need a, a softer touch. People are not constant and they're not fixed, right? They change depending on where they're at in the world at any given time. It's funny, uh, we do this premium review service where members of our premium service, they can send us rolling footage and we'll have it broken down, right? So someone, frankly, much smarter than me will take a look and like analyze the technique. And one of the things I've started doing is I've started telling people, look, if you want you can give me an indicator in terms of what type of feedback you're looking for. I basically give them a spice scale. Like when you go to a restaurant, right? Like, do you want mild, regular, <laughs> spicy, or yeah. extra spicy? Easy, medium, or hard. Yeah. So I've got some coaches who are very encouraging. You know, they'll give you great advice, but they're going to take a softer touch and they're going to try to build up your confidence. And then I've got other coaches who are just going to tell you, you suck right to their face, right? Because different people want different feedback and, and at different times in their life. So I, I found that by turning the keys over to the students and basically asking them, like, look, how, you know, what do you need right now? Do you need a pep talk or do you need someone to kick your ass? Now, I'm very curious, what are statistically the, the answers you get the most? Do most people really want that, that harsh reaction or, or is it all over the place? All over the place. Hmm. And, and what often happens, too, is a lot of the time when people come on board out of the gate, they don't know that this is a thing, right? So I will use my best judgment to try to match them up with someone. So, for example, if it's a competitive video, so let's say someone gives me some footage to review and it's a, a competition, especially if it's a high-level competition, I'm probably going to put it in front of someone who is way more knowledgeable than me about high-level competition. On the other hand, if it's a hobbyist, you know, there's a lot of other instructors who can probably take that and provide more low level, you know, kind of like base level foundational advice. But what I do find though, is that the more people get comfortable with the process, the more they open up and they're, you know, a lot of them are kind of more willing to, to go up to the next level and get more blunt feedback in a lot of ways. But also, you know, sometimes the opposite goes, right? I mean, we all have these days. Yeah. I certainly have these days where some days I'm just not in the mood, right? Like I don't need a drill sergeant yelling at me today. I need like a softer touch. Mm -hmm. That happens to everybody sometimes. And, you know, so sometimes you might have someone who normally is on the, the blunter end of the spectrum, but they just have a, you know, they need to have their confidence managed too. You need to build that back up if you get rattled. And sometimes even the person who might prefer the blunter feedback on the wrong day, they might want something different, right? So again, like you said, it's, it's the responsibility of the coach to read the room, to read the students, and to know what kind of approach is going to be the best at any given time. Yeah, yeah. And it also depends on the topic. For instance, for me personally, I had a, a coach here uh, last week for a seminar and had that on several occasions as well, asking them for uh, business advice. And in that case, I always tell them beforehand, I want you to be as blunt and harsh as you can be because I need that. I need you to tell me, no, Tim, you're doing it wrong. Shut up and do it like this. And I really enjoyed that feedback because that, that sets my mind to improving. Whilst on other topics, I do appreciate a more constructive, positive feedback. So it also depends on topics. And as you said, it depends on the mood. Sometimes you can, I can already see from a student the way he walks into gym, like, okay, this day, this guy's just going to need, he just needs to roll. I usually roll with them personally, I have them completely rage out at me and, you know, just get it all off, get the work day off or whatever's playing your private life. And, you know, as long as you don't injure anyone, I think that that's very important for safety. But, you know, sometimes you can just read their face and see, okay, today they need this. And also in competition, I've had students recently, a guy who was like, he gave up mid competition. That was the first time I ever saw that on one of my students. He was having his first competition ever, white belt tournament. And mid competition, he just like, mentally quit he finished the match he lost the points but that, that's not important but i saw i knew him i saw in his head he like gave up so i asked him hey, hey man what happened he said yeah i just he took me down and he passed me so i was like uh, i i wasn't having it anymore I'm like okay okay that's that's interesting and then we had a small conversation and uh, he was so mentally out of the uh, he wasn't at present anymore he was like like giving up or like he was he was ready to quit. Then we had a conversation. I said, okay, how are you going to fix it? And how are you going to deal with this mental setback? And then it resulted in him calling me next day saying that he registered for the next competition. And I was so proud for that huge, because he had all the reasons to never compete again, because he thought, well, he lost everything and he didn't enjoy it that much. But having him going so far out of his comfort zone and re-registering for another competition the day after, I was so proud. And I asked him, okay, what made you do that? And uh, I had a really interesting chat about that and seeing, okay, how can people, how do people sometimes need a little bit of support and how do they sometimes need a little bit of a, well, maybe as I can say, kick under the butt or tough love to to get them to the next level, to get them back to what it is that they need. And also depending not only on the, the person individually, 
or on their current phase or state of mind, as you say, that that changes from time to time, but also on what topic is it. Some people are so, like me, for instance, I really want harsh business advice, but if it's about more personal stuff, I'd rather have a more positive and, and feedback, I think, if I'm reflecting correctly. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking the same thing. When it comes to anything related to business, I just want you to hit me with it, right? Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. If I'm not doing something great, I just want to know about it so I can fix it. But if someone were to give me feedback on like how to be a better dad or how to take care of my child better, mm. I'm just not sure I can emotionally separate myself from the situation enough to handle that well, right? Like I, I would need a softer approach. I wouldn't want someone to come in and tell me like, Steve, you're being an awful father, right? I would not handle that particularly well. Yeah. And, and that is because, because it, you're so emotionally involved in that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now take jujitsu. You're emotionally involved in jujitsu, I assume, right? Because you really love jujitsu. Oh yeah, but I mean, like anything, right? With, with, like with any hobby, it waxes and it wanes, right? Sometimes I'm super passionate about it, but honestly, sometimes I I need a break, and that's something I've tried to get better about as I I get older. You know, you realize after you've been training this thing for a while that look, jujitsu is always going to be there. If you need to take some time off, you can do that and don't beat yourself up over it. So it's like any hobby, right? It waxes and it wanes. Sometimes I'm really enthusiastic. Sometimes I got something else going on and I just can't seem to make the time. Hmm. And you also said about the rolling footage and how you combine different coaches with different people. So you have different coaches, as you just said, combining them. Does it also apply for the Discord community that you have? Because I read a little bit about your program. You also have a Discord community, am I right? Yeah, most of our coaches are in the community as well. And of course, there's a lot of people in there who take different approaches too. you know, managing a community. And this is actually a topic I'd love to discuss on the podcast at some point, but managing a community is mm. an interesting thing because you get enough people together in one place and there's always going to be two people who just don't jive well together, right? So part of what you have to do as the community manager, when someone comes in and they need help with something, you try to steer them to whoever's going to help them the most. But the good yeah. news is that most of the people in our community are super supportive. We've tried to weed out the assholes as, as best as possible. Sometimes though, I will get someone who just comes in and says like, just roast me, right? Just tear me <laughs> apart. Give me the real honest feedback. I need to hear it. Well, you should turn them to Reddit then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well reddit is maybe too far in that direction right the problem <laughs> with reddit is that you will get roasted but often by people who have no idea what they're talking about yeah, <laughs> so yeah, you'll yeah. get very you'll get very very severe intense advice that is probably incorrect <laughs> this would never work on a, a tough guy this would never work in the streets yeah yeah yeah, that's beautiful. I do love how on Reddit you'll have like Lachlan Giles on there posting something and then some idiot white belt will just reply and be like, that would never work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. okay. You tell Lachlan that's never yeah, going to work, yeah. white belt. Yeah, I love that. But there's a beautiful loophole, but what you just uh, said to go back to, to our first topic is when you said on the community, putting people together with the correct people. And maybe it's a, it's a far stretch thing, but as a coach, when students have certain questions or topics they're very interested in, putting them with the right professional and also realizing that might not always be you. That is also something I think is very important for creating a safe environment. And that goes back again to the thing I mentioned about approachable coaches and how a good approachable coach doesn't control or own his students. And he doesn't, doesn't always claim to be a black belt at everything. So a perfect example, just taking my, myself as a humble student of jiu-jitsu, when someone asks me, for example, on a topic that I'm not so familiar with, leading back to competence, for instance, and not every, let's say, not every purple belt or brown belt or black belt has to be both perfect in his spider guard as well as his Delhiva guard, as well as his lack locks, as well as his mirabolos, right? So you have those topics where you're better at, your, your specific skill set and how you can get the game towards that game. That's also very important in your competence. But as a coach, also realizing that you don't know everything and also openly admitting that to your students and showing your own weaknesses also makes for a very safe or safer climate. And also there is obviously a not that black and white area because people also want to feel that you are as a coach competent and that you know what you're talking of and that you don't show a lot of weakness but showing no weakness and being very tough is also not good on the good side of the spectrum for me myself and if other coaches do that they should do that uh, whatever they think is best but uh, showing for instance when you have a student coming up to me asking about the newest trend on bucky jokes i will say man i have no idea but i'm gonna find out for you 
or direct you to the one to a person that does know or trying to connect you to these or these students that are very familiar with that. Just to loophole back to what you said about the Discord community, putting people together with the correct people and doing so and showing that you are not always the guy who knows it all as a teacher is also something that I think contributes to a safe environment. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing too, which we haven't even gotten into is one of the reasons as the instructor or coach that you want to be approachable is because if you run a business for any period of time, something bad is eventually going to happen, right? Like there's going to be a student who is dangerous for one reason or another, right? Or there's going to be some element to the gym, you know, if you're unlucky, possibly even a criminal element that you as the instructor would want to know about and remove And that's going to be real hard if your students aren't comfortable talking with the instructor, right? One of the reasons why you want to be open and approachable is because as the instructor, if something bad happens within your academy, you want to know about it right away so you can fix it. And so if you try to create this aura of, you know, uh, expressing vulnerability as weakness, you run the risk of a situation where people are afraid to bring legitimate concerns to you as the business owner that you would probably really want to know about. So that's yet another reason why I think from a cultural standpoint, it's important to make people feel safe about speaking out even when they aren't necessarily comfortable doing so. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I 100% agree, especially with, uh, besides physical safety, the mental safety. And uh, as I just said, for instance, the, the kid I spoke about in my practical example earlier about getting injured with the armbar and feeling mentally not so happy at the, at the club, he could have made 100 excuses as to why he wasn't showing up or he could have just ignored me or said, yeah, I don't want to train anymore or whatever. But he openly told me and uh, trying to find a solution because he felt safe enough. And I've had this in the past also with other students or, for instance, a a female uh, feeling she gets, she doesn't get the right type of, how do you say, she gets too rough handled by very tough, very heavy male team members. Hope I'm saying that all right. Yeah, yeah. But you get what I mean. And then her coming to me after class or before class saying like, hey, I do think those people don't do it on purpose, but they just don't realize they're like 40 kilos heavier. I don't know how many pounds, but they're like 40 kilos heavier than I am. And they're not realizing that, but I just don't really want to roll with them anymore. How should I go about that? How should I tell them? Or should I just keep it for myself? And those things. And for me, that's the first thing I always say, like, I'm so happy that you came to me. I'm so happy that you involved me in this. So let's try to find a solution. But those are the perfect things. Now, mind you, if that isn't happening at your gym, if no one ever comes with you with any problem whatsoever, trust me or don't trust me, but I think you're not running the perfect gym. People are just not feeling safe enough to express it. Things are going to happen eventually, as you said. Eventually, things are going to happen. People together at any workplace, take 30 of your colleagues. If you have 30 colleagues, do you get along with all of them? Do you never have any issues with any of them? Of course not. And jiu-jitsu, if you have 30 teammates or 50 teammates, eventually, yeah, you're going to bump into each other or something happens and it's normal. And acting as if that doesn't happen, that's that's just naive. But accepting that it happens and then trying to look for solutions and, okay, how can we deal with that as a community and as a team and especially as a coach where you should feel responsible for this and you should feel responsible for having everyone feel at home and appreciated and valued. Having it happen means that it's good and people feel safe. I took that from elementary school, to be honest. A perfect example is that statistically, statistically, a lot of kids get bullied at every school. And statistically, some kids get abused at school, which is a fact. I'm not sure about the exact statistics, so I'm not naming numbers, but I think you would agree that happens at every school, right? Someone gets bullied or sexually assaulted. Absolutely. I remember very negative experiences at, you know, my own high school and middle school when I was in school, right? I mean, a lot of the, I think most people can relate. A lot of the most traumatic memories you're going to have in your life are going to happen before you're an adult. And the thing is, I mean, yeah, in retrospect, maybe those aren't really huge issues, but when you're a kid, these things are your entire world, right? And things that might seem silly to a grown up, they can be mentally devastating to a child to the point where sometimes they may never truly recover. Yep, they could traumatize your life. Now ask the teacher, ask a random teacher, okay, so is bullying a thing in your class? Is sexual assault a thing in your class? Is abusement a thing in your class? They would say no, most of them. Because the thing is not only that it doesn't happen, the thing is you're just not aware. So if you're a coach, for example, you think like, hey, no one ever comes to me or we don't have that at our gym. Everyone's just happy getting along. No, statistically, they aren't. You're just not aware of it. 
okay, why are you not aware of it? Either you're not seeing it, you're not noticing it, or they don't feel safe enough to involve you in it. And that might sound a little bit harsh, so I'm not trying to offend anyone, whatever. I'm just, I think it's a very interesting topic. And I think the same goes for classrooms. So I'm just trans- translating this from a classroom to a jiu academy. Yes, bullying still happens, even at jiu academies, even at the workplace. I think statistically, bullying at the workplace for adults is something that happens, well, maybe at every company. Do you think so? 100%. I mean, it's it's like you said, right? I mean, despite your best intentions, there is always going to be that person who who is that negative influence. And in a lot of cases, honestly, that person might not even be trying to be a, the negative influence, but they just wind up being that yep. for whatever reason, whether it be just power dynamics or just a miscommunication or misunderstanding. So it, it is inevitable. And so for someone, like you said, for someone to say, well, I don't have that problem here, because I hear this all the time, right? Whenever there is a a new accusation in jujitsu, people always pop out of the woodwork and say, wow, well, I'm so glad that we don't have those problems in our academy. <laughs> yeah. I hate to tell you, you do. You, you just do. don't know about it. You're just not aware. Exactly. And that awareness or that creating that atmosphere and that social safe environment where people feel safe to approach you on this, whether that is by message, email, or better yet, in, in person, or at least in any way, have them feel like it's okay to ask things, but also to say things and mention things. And not only going about the team, but also to you as a coach, I want my students to give me feedback on things I should do better. And if they don't ever give me feedback, I'm not the perfect coach, Steve. They just don't feel safe enough or I'm not just aware of it. And being open for criticism doesn't make you weak. And being open to uh, seeing that things might be might need fiction doesn't make you weak. It makes you open for improvement, which I think is crucial for not only having a healthy uh, environment, but also improving for a more healthier environment and growing as a team, as a sport, as a community, and as a coach individually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, Tom, that's a lot of stuff that we covered here. And I am mindful of the fact that it's getting close to, I think, 2 a.m. your time. <laughs> so, oh, man, it is. I will use this as a cue then. Anything that you wanted to, to add here before we close this one out? Or did we cover everything? I think we covered a lot, man. And I think uh, the takeaway, which happens a lot, actually, when I discuss topics, not only, not only on Jiu-Jitsu, but in general, is that it's a, it's a gray area often. And it's not the extremes, but it's also being open for the other spectrum. If you're very sensitive on this, and if you're very open and very focused on a social climate, then also appreciate that being tough is a tool that you can use at the right time. And if you're very tough and say Jiu-Jitsu is hard, you should train and bop, 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 and drill, drill, drill maybe it's it's a good time to wake up and look in the mirror and say, hey, there might also be something for me here to be a bit more aware or uh, waking up to a more social, safe environment. And finding the sweet balance for you as a person that fits your own personality or coaching style and that fits your gym and the way you want to run your, your gym or school or, or if you're a student listening that, hey, might feel that you're at the right place, I think is very important. And just like you switch workplaces or, or schools, I think in jiu-jitsu also, every school has a different philosophy and a lot of schools have a different way of going about jiu-jitsu. And it's just for you finding the right place and then also trying some different things, trying some different teaching methods as a coach, but also trying some different gyms as a student and seeing, okay, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And where do I truly feel at home in this, this sport that we all love? Uh, I think that's a nice way how I want to round it up. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. I really appreciate having you come by. Before we let you go, why don't you go through the plugs again? Tell us how people can follow you, where they can check out your work, how they can get your instructionals. Put it all on the table here. Okay, I'm going to start off with the OnlyFans because that's where I make the most money. No, <laughs> uh, just, uh, guys, it's just just the usual, man. I think Instagram is the best way to, to reach out to me. I get a lot of cool messages from all over the world and I try to get back to everyone because I truly love the community. So if you ever send me a message, please try Instagram. If I don't get back to you, just send another one, please. Uh, it just ends up in DMs. YouTube is where I put out most of my stuff we just put it out all out for free there instructions and videos and after movies and all the stuff that's energy at martial arts but i'm sure steve will put a link down below uh, same thing goes for our website the fight gear is called energy of fightwear we send rash guards keys belts all over the world so if you ever need any gear let me hook you up or just send me a message on instagram i think those are the best ones and for the the, the true nerds out there getting into instructionals yeah you might have heard of a platform called bgg fanatics if you're not familiar with it, they put out <laughs> some videos sometimes. I'm actually on there. I was the first ever Dutch guy on there on BJ Fanatics. So that's the, the only thing I ever accomplished in my life. But it's fun. It's all Leclocks for now. But if you are into Leclocks, you should definitely check out Leclocks Unlocked and Leclocks Unlocked Part 2, which are my instructions over there. 
yeah, you'll also find that in the link below, I think. So thank you so much for listening. And if you ever want anything, just reach out to me or have any request on a video or anything you want to discuss, just send a message on Instagram and I'll hope to get back to you. No problem, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I will, as always, put those links in the show notes. So if anyone is interested in following Tom or checking out his work, just pop open the show notes. You'll find the info there. One click through and you can get right to where you can contact him or check out his work. And of course, on our side, as I say at the end of every episode, this whole thing is brought to you and funded by BJJ Mental Models Premium. That's the uh, next step to the BJJ Mental Models experience. If you like the stuff that we do here, you will definitely like it. There's a lot of stuff on there that we already covered here on the podcast. Uh, Probably one of the more marquee benefits being our awesome review service. We've got a team of truly world-class black belts. And when I say truly world-class, I mean like multiple-time black belt world champion black belts. So there's a lot of great people on that side who can give you feedback that you'll probably benefit tremendously from. Super reasonably priced. It's only 20 bucks a month and you get the first week free. We also have a ton of masterclass style audio lectures and courses on there with, again, people who really specialize in this stuff. So if you love the stuff that we talk about here on the show and you're looking for a longer form, kind of like multi-part course style conversation to unpack all of these ideas that's where you go to get it you can get all of that at bjjmentalmodels.com again there's a seven day free trial and i'll put the link right in the show notes for anyone who's interested that's bjjmentalmodels.com so thanks a lot to everyone who supports us there tom thanks a lot to you for coming by really appreciate it i appreciate you staying up late with me and of course thanks to everyone out there listening as well i really appreciate you too thank you steve thank you so much you're welcome man talk to you soon and to everyone out there listening we'll talk to you next week take care